Well, yesterday, Cardinal Roulette responded to Archbishop Vigano and calls him all kinds of things. This letter that comes out, it seems, with papal approval, and look at that in just a moment, um, really goes for the throat on Archbishop Vigano and accuses him of uh, division, even schism, uh, re removing himself from communion with the Pope, and also lying about the details of ex-Cardinal McCarrick. And here joining me today to talk about it is Timothy Gordon, author of Catholic Republic. Timothy, welcome back. Thanks again. Good to be back, as always. So I thought we would just go into this letter that Cardinal Ouellette wrote directly to Archbishop Vigano. It's also interesting, people have already commented on this, that he never refers to Archbishop Vigano as a cleric, as an no. archbishop, a bishop, a right. priest. Uh, he does use the word brother, but I thought that was interesting. And um, I always thought it was protocol that when bishops address each other formally, they would use those titles. But, you know, it's, it's an oddity, too. I don't know if it's meant to be a diss or not. So the most important element in this letter, I think, is really in the first paragraph. And Cardinal Ouellette begins by saying, with pontifical permission, and in my capacity as prefect for the Congregation for Bishops, I offer my testimony about matters concerning the Archbishop Emeritus of Washington, D.C., Theodore McCarrick. So right off mm -hmm. the bat, Timothy, he's saying, I'm doing this with pontifical permission. Do you think that means that Pope Francis has vetted this letter? I would guess so. I, I mean, everyone's, everyone's out there making the guess. It, it, it sort of has to. Whenever you have a letter by uh, uh, a good son who's attempting to ingratiate himself to, let's say, a, a re rebuked father. In, in so let, let's, this is the papa that we're talking about here, the pope. And essentially, Vigano was the, the, the bad son who leveled some sort of critique. It seems to have serious legs, as we've talked about ad nauseum, the critique that he leveled you know, six weeks ago now. And Cardinal Ouellette has positioned himself as the good son, the, pardon the term, a kind of brown noser who's saying, there's no problem here. You know, Papa doesn't, you know, have any troubles. The family is perfect, even though it, at times throughout this letter, he's, he's admitting that, that there would be a contradiction and asserting that the Papa has been perfect. And yeah, he, he's essentially doing this with the sanction, official or unofficial, of the Pope. Now, I, I'm presuming that, that, uh, you know, there's some sort of right of first refusal offered by the sea because he's so clearly trying to ingratiate himself there too. Right. And I mean, since Vigano, Vigano calls out Roulette by name in his second testimony, we did a video on that last week. You'll see that in the upper right-hand corner. You can link over and watch that. That's our Vigano part two. Uh, since he's called out by name, Roulette wants to clear himself of the charges. And we'll see he doesn't exactly do that in this letter. Um, but I can right. only imagine with the stakes so high and this being such a thorn in the side of Pope Francis that this letter would have been cleared by Pope Francis and his team. Sure. You know, if you're a cardinal and you're, you're writing against direct accusations of Archbishop Vigano calling for Francis's resignation on one of the most, well, the most scandalous uh, ecclesiastical event in American church history, which is Theodore McCarrick. Um, right. You know, you can just think of a small corporation or even a school um, in a scandalous situation. A teacher's not going to write a public letter without having the principal or headmaster look it over. But we're talking right. about the Catholic Church here. So, right. So, Roulette lays that down at the beginning. He says, with pontifical permission and in my capacity as prefect for the congregation for bishops. So, he's not just speaking as um, a private hierarch or as a cardinal, he's speaking from his. Uh, from his office as prefect. Uh, sure. The next thing he does is he, he goes after Vigano and he says, out of consideration for the good collaborative relation we had when you were Apostolic Nuncio in Washington, allow me to say in all honesty that I find your current attitude incomprehensible and extremely troubling, not only because of the confusion it sows among the people of God, but because your public accusations gravely harm the reputation of the bishops successors of the apostles. So here's where he starts to make some accusations. Uh, what do you think about right. this, Timothy? 
I think this is this is a serious counter accusation, and it, it, it beggars the question. When let's say Saint Paul rebukes, you know, the first Pope Peter in Galatians chapter two verse eleven, as Peter arrives in Antioch, is uh, is Paul's opposition to Peter's theological error uh, a political plot, a, a, a tawdry, pathetic, cheap political positioning? Of course not, right? So I, I really, this has become known as the Cardinal Willette letter to Archbishop Vigano. I, I, would, I would wonder if Cardinal Willette would have been as comfortable writing a, a letter counter-condemning uh, St. Paul for his his accusations against his public public accusations against the first pope Peter. I, I, I mean, yeah. Why, he's, why, don't, he's, why, why don't I read that? I just pulled it up while you're talking. This is Galatians two. You referenced it in the the last interview we did on uh, Vigano Cardinal Willette, Pope Francis. Uh, this is from Saint Paul's Epistle to the Galatians, and it's in chapter two, verse eleven. And Paul writes, and when Paul says Cephas or Kepha, that's the Aramaic name for Peter. Um, so originally Jesus and the apostles spoke Aramaic, and so Peter's name was Cephas, which means rock. Later, as the church becomes more Greek, his name is Petros, which means rock, Peter. But here, Galatians, which is one of the first Pauline epistles, he uses Cephas. So Paul writes this in verse 11, quote, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And with him, the rest of the Jews acted insincerely, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their insincerity. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I came to Cephas before them all and said, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? Etc. So, this is uh, Paul, and he says that he does it to Peter's face and in the company of other people. So it's a, it's a public rebuke. Um, and in honesty, St. Paul is following the teaching of Jesus Christ that you go to the person, right? And then right. to others. So Paul seems to be doing following the dominical instructions. And it's not fair here to say that uh, Paul is trying to attack the papacy or that Paul's trying to sow discord in the church. As a matter of fact, the discord s sowed in the church in this scenario was by Peter. Sure, Peter was making distinctions between the circumcised and uncircumcised Catholic Christians, those who were Jewish and those who weren't. And then also, it seems, implying that the Gentiles, who were not following the law, who were not eating kosher food and not circumcised, were somehow second-class Christians in the church. Look, error always sows discord in the church, whether it's sowed from the heart of the Sea of Peter or it's sowed, it's sown in the la laity uh, and, and it spreads you know, upward. It can trickle down or it can trickle up, even though that doesn't really make sense. Uh, it can go either way. And, and in the history of the papacy, starting even with Arianism, you know, the history of the episcopacy, this, it's happened both ways. So the idea that, that Cardinal Ouellette is attempting to popularize here and see if it has legs, that error always inheres on the side of an attacker of the papacy is absurd. I mean, he offered, that it's just errant, the it's errant theological uh, um, dissertation on what the papacy is, what, what the post-Vatican I teachings ought to be. Aside from the errant theological teachings, all he offers is personal... Uh, uh, opining, where he says, I, I very much doubt that McCarrick interested Pope Francis to the point that you would have us believe. Things like that. There's there's assertion one after another like that, where he, yeah, that's fine. You can report to us, Cardinal Ouellette, what you very much personally doubt. None of it's really worth anything aside from the the um, the official position he strikes, which is theologically wrong. Again, this is just, it's wrong when you consider what he would, by dint of implication, be having to say to St. Paul himself. Take it a step further. You mentioned um, Jesus's admonition in Matthew chapter 18 about first, you know, if your brother offends you, first go to him, then take a few others along, then go to the whole church. 
um, it's no different when rebuking um, a pope. And consider this, uh, two chapters before that in Matthew chapter 16, it's a line after, it's two verses after Jesus makes Peter the first pope. He calls him Satan, right? Yeah, get behind so, me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan, is in Matthew uh, 16, uh, verse 21 or 22 or something. He's just made him pope. So I guess if we follow Cardinal Willett's reasoning to the full natural conclusion, it, it beggars, we would be condemning our Lord himself right. for at recently having uh, um, ordained the first pope condemning him as Satan. Get behind me, Satan. It makes no sense. And this is the kind of papalatry we've been talking about. The people yeah. are have now adopted the the opposition point of view, what what we've always defended, you know, Vatican I against characterizations like this. Yeah. And, and thanks be to God for Vatican I, because Vatican I, you might think, lifts the Pope to the highest heavens because it declares he's infallible on faith and morals ex cathedra. Right. Right. But in, in fact, it actually lowers him, not lowers him, restricts him in saying, look, he's infallible in faith and morals ex cathedra. He right. has universal jurisdiction over the church, and his teaching office is restricted infallibly with faith and morals ex cathedra. So that's very right. important. And I think it's interesting in this letter, it's, it's primarily, he in the intro, says it's about McCarrick, ex cardinal McCarrick. But as we'll get into this in the text here, Willett brings up a Morris Letizia. So we so Willett's also seeing that there's a moral situation and there's a doctrinal situation. And let's be honest, Pope Francis has not spoken infallibly on either to date. Right. So right. These are open questions. We addressed this last time, and I just want to take one one half a moment to clarify um, that that dear friends out there who are on generally speaking the right side of this have divided between the Pope being wrong about faith or, and or morals versus papal behavior, which is a function of papal belief on uh, faith and morals. There is no room for this division, right? Because the only scriptural example that, that exists for us for the, the fraternal correction of one bishop to the Bishop of Rome, uh, Paul to Peter, is, is a theological correction. And so there's no, there's really no room for the kind of um, mental reservation like, hey, you can you can rebuke the Pope when he's acting wrongly, which which, you know, Peter was when he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles in in Galatians, where where Paul addresses him. But it's also a doctrinal issue arising from the Council of Jerusalem, the first things that 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 happened in early 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 church history in the first generation. And, and because behavior is always a function of what we believe, right? Remember our yeah. Archbishop Sheen, if you don't act how you believe, then you'll believe how you act. There's this fundamental connection between behavior and belief. So there's really no, I, I've always opposed this strongly, the idea that we can dichotomize, you know, criticisms of papal behavior and criticisms of papal teaching. And, and I'm, I'm just bringing this up because now you're pointing out that, that, um, Cardinal Willett is implicitly, tacitly endorsing the same thing from the opposite point of view because he brings up a Morris Letizia, right? I mean, it's if you believe that the Pope is beyond repro reproach in in behavior, then you're going to believe that the Pope is beyond reproach in in matters of of doctrine, which he is when he speaks on faith and morals ex cathedra. Ex cathedra, sure. Pope Francis sure. has not once ever done that. Sure. So now along this line, I, I want to read this, what Cardinal Willette writes, and it echoes what you just stated. Uh, he says, quote, is not communion with the successor of Peter an expression of our obedience to Christ, who chose him and sustains him with his grace, end quote. Now, the first part is absolutely correct. Is not our communion yes. with the successor of Peter an expression of our obedience to Christ? Absolutely I'm not running away from the, from the papacy or from the Bishop of Rome. I want to be in communion with Pope Francis, or whoever is the, the one who holds the chair of St. Peter. I believe that my salvation hangs upon that. That's why I became a Catholic. You know, I was an Episcopalian 
priest. And I went to Mass once with Pope Benedict in Rome, and I knew I couldn't receive communion. I was like, I am not in communion with the successor of Peter. And I had this sense that if I don't enter into communion with him, I will be damned. This is a necessary gift that Jesus has given the church, and I need to accept that gift if I'm going to accept salvation. So, Cardinal Willette, we are all thumbs up on this. We all agree. It's really the second part of the sentence that kind of makes me scratch my head. I'm like, I'm not so sure about that, where he says, um, Christ, who chose him and sustains him with his grace. In God's providence, everything happens according to his will, but that doesn't mean with his specific active will that he chooses every single pope. Would you agree with that? Right. Like there might have been a really there might have been a really holy great man that you know would have been a better pope in you know fifteen twelve or thirteen forty eight who would have been a better pope, but because of the time, sometimes our Lord hands us over to false shepherds, you know. So it doesn't necessarily mean that every and, pope is infallibly chosen. Yeah, providence works as far as I can tell. Thus, it works thus. You connect the dots afterwards. And to these folks that, in a way, it's kind of like Puritanism insofar as some of these these Catholics who want to see the guidance of the Holy Spirit in conclaves and in, I guess, now even synods as determinative of right automatic righteousness. Mm -hmm. They're they're being Puritan insofar as they're not wanting to live with their own the contingency of existence. Like yes. being a Christian is not, as the atheists say, reductive in the simplistic way where once you become a Christian you have all the answers and you're no longer historically contingent after where you that you cannot escape that. Becoming a Christian does not mean that um that you have all the answers, right? It, it does not mean that all the popes are immaculate. It, no, none of the popes have been immaculate. And, and the important thing is that um, we have to own the fact that the Holy Spirit somehow acts mysteriously, as part of the mystagogy of the church, um, in such a way to guide the church, but I think he does so in a long-term sense, the same sense in which you can only connect the dots afterwards. Uh, for What I mean here is, Vatican I was interrupted right by the Franco-Prussian War and was, was never, many have argued, um, rightly concluded or properly ha did it have closure, to borrow a term of the psychotherapeutic establishment. And it's being hammered out arguably now by, by Francis's pontificate insofar as we're asking all these questions because they're arising Aporiatically, it's a term Aristotle would use. We're running into all the problems, and we're, you know, Catholic theologians are going to be now, in for the next 50 to 100 years, working out what the implications of this pontificate are. That's how the Holy Spirit works. That's how uh, Christ continues to work on earth among the, the magisterium, the men right. who are administering right. the church very, very badly yeah. in our day. Um, so this idea of uh, apostolic ascetis, uh, namini uh, judicatur, that no man is to judge the pope. That's true. No man is to sanction the pope, which you and I have repeated ad nauseum. We, we keep saying this, so we're not trying to sanction the pope. But men can point out where the errors happen. There's a difference. We're not the judges. That's right. And, you know, appealing to the office and authority for truth, with the exception as that Vatican I sets out, is an example of this problem of clericalism that Pope Francis is condemning. So he's like, hey, he's right. the Pope. How dare you do this? But what if we turn back the clock 40 years and say, hey, he's the Archbishop of Newark. How dare you make an accusation that he acted immorally towards a young man? We're talking about McCarrick. And people actually did that. And if you right. look back at these archives, you look at the, the uh, Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, a frequent, a frequent uh, echo in these accusations are bishops, archbishops, priests, and even family members saying, how dare you say that he's a successor of the apostles? That's a problem. Right. That's it's an ugly thing. It it's is. an ugly thing. It's, it's, cl it's clericalism in the context of, of what's supposed to be non-political power. 
Yes. And it's it's ugly. I think every every Catholic out there, even the ones who now have become shifted to a position of papalatry, which it sounds like Cardinal Ouellet is right on the doorstep of uh, of doing, um, they would acknowledge it. It's ugly when you say don't you know don't speak out against Emperor Nero or Emperor Caligula. You know he's he's the emperor. Or don't, don't tell the emperor that he's got no clothes on. He's he's got uh, you know the finest finery. We're doing what they're doing it quite nakedly, no pun intended, with regard to the Roman pontiff. And it it's got no place in religion. And like I said, it's got no place in the Catholic religion, I should say. And um, again, what, Cardinal Willette would not only, if St. Paul were alive today, be condemning the righteous, rightful actions of St. Paul. He would be condemning the Holy Spirit, right? Because the Holy Spirit was, was the the ultimate author of, you know, the Scripture uh, in in Galatians, Galatians chapter two, verse. Yep. Yeah, and and Christ Himself, because yep. in Matthew chapter sixteen, Christ, after He's made Peter Pope, I thought it was before when I first looked at this. It's right after He's made Pope. Yep. He's He's delegated that power already. He still condemns him. So we don't want to be uh, smokescreen patriots when it comes to the Pope. And, and it seems too late at this point. Some people seem lost in papalatry. Yep, yep. Well, it's it, the very next line from the one I just read is where Cardinal Willett goes into Amoris Laetitia. So why don't I read that one? He says, quote, My interpretation of Amoris Laetitia, which you criticize, is grounded in this fidelity to the living tradition which Francis has given us another example of by recently modifying the catechism of the Catholic Church on the question of the death penalty. And when I read that, I said, aha, this change of the catechism mm -hmm. is ultimately not about, in my opinion, not about the change of the death penalty, but it's about the ability to mess around with the catechism of the Catholic Church like a dry erase board. And they're mm -hmm. using this already. This is the first time I've seen you know a cardinal do it. They're using it already as a precedent to change. What do you think about this? I think it sounds uh, a lot like what we heard two weeks ago. That uh, actually, I think it was re-reported two weeks ago. That that Pope Francis is above the magisterium of the the Catholic Church, or that it, it's at his subservice in some way. I think it's outright creepy uh and it's it's no longer even being camouflaged by the lieutenants of pope francis the way it was in the months following the publication of amoris Letizia. then it was more measured right I'm, I'm talking in april may june july of 2016 after amoris Letizia was published and they were kind of like he made the big changes first and you know i think they're kind of tiptoeing around the fact that there were these obvious you know, problems with chapter eight of Amoris Laetitia. And now they kind of let it settle over here. And, and some more, many more things have happened since then. And now the revisitation of Amoris Laetitia with the, the bizarre assumption that opposition to the sitting Pope is blasphemous is precisely what it seems to be that you're squinting toward, uh, Dr. Marshall it seems to be a kind of, um, um, a slow congealing of this new papal infallibility that they're the, the, a wrong headed papal infallibility that they seem to be uh, insinuating. It's, it's, cre I don't know what else to say. It's creepy. Yeah. I mean, it, it when, bothers me. It's deeply when, bothersome. When Amoris Letizia came out, people were reading it. Everybody started calling each other. Theologians, we started talking to each other. Like, did you see that? What does that mean? Where is this going? What about the footnote? And then we had the Dubia by the four Dubia brothers. We keep bringing up the Dubia brothers. And that, again, was following dominical protocol, right? Hey, Holy Father, this could be taken as heretical. This could undermine the Holy Sacrament right. of Matrimony as indissoluble. Um, this could be used to then validate homosexual unions or divorce and remarriage, etc. Could you please clarify this for us? And here we are in years later and there is no answer and so the response is just like our lord said you go to the go to the brother in this case it's the father the holy father and you ask for clarification here we are years later and 
he won't answer the Dubia brothers. And then he answers that he's not going to answer Vigano, not one word. So, you know, what's a Catholic to do? Well, we have just on Saturday, uh, two days ago, the, I guess, 6th of October, the Holy See issued a statement promising a, quote, thorough study of its own McCarrick files. Don't hold your breath for the kind of investigation that that um, bills itself as in any way involved. Right. So this I'm not holding mine. This this right. will not be an honest answering of the question put to Pope Francis by Archbishop Vigano. It's going to be McCarrick in the third party, in the third person sense. It'll be very clinical and it'll be sure footed not to um, co involve itself in any of the, the right. goings on, at least in the language, of course. It, it, I mean, as you pointed out earlier, Dr. Marshall, I mean, it, there are several tacit admissions in this response by Cardinal Willett that, that automatically co-involve. It's beyond yes. doubt at let, this point. Here, let me read them. But, Since but Francis on. will not answer to that. Let me yeah. read them. So yeah. the most, the, the, the grenade in this letter, this testimony by Cardinal Willett in response to Vigano confirms Vigano's accusation. And, you know, maybe if we, you know, just sideswipe everything that's in this, that's in this letter by Willett, what I'm about to read right now is explosive. Cardinal Willett writes this, quote, Moreover, the written instructions given to you by the Congregation for Bishops at the beginning of your mission in 2001 did not say anything about McCarrick, except for what I mentioned to you verbally about his situation as Bishop Emeritus and certain conditions and restrictions that he had to follow on account of some rumors about his past conduct. Then he goes on in just two more lines. The former cardinal retired in May of 2006, had been requested not to travel or to make public appearances in order to avoid new rumors about him. That was in 2006. That's Pope Benedict XVI, right? This is it. This is it. V Vigano, yeah. his testimony was just validate. Well, let's try to undermine Vigano here, but he just built up Vigano's testimony. He states it could, certain it conditions possible? and restrictions. Is... He doesn't use the word sanctions, which is Vigano's word. But he says right. conditions and restrictions, right. and he even names what they're not to travel, not to make public appearances. Right. Is it possible? I, I just had this notion just now that. That Cardinal Ouellette is, under the guise of uh, a defense in an apologia of Francis, attempting to bulwark what, what Vigano said and in, in, in doing it, you know, using Romita as, you know. Wait, you're the, saying the that Ouellette's actually trying to help lucky. Vigano? Right, perhaps. Uh. I don't know. Yeah, think about it. Because that, I, I don't know. But except that is the bombshell. What you just read is the... Uh, is the KT boundary between being wrong and being right, as it were. I, I mean, mean he, what else does Vigano need? I know, and Willette didn't have to write this. These two paragraphs, no, they're not no. necessary to the debate. Unless Willette's no. just trying to clear his name because he thinks, okay, Vigano's going to come out with part three, which we know Vigano, Vigano's probably going to come out with part three. And I guarantee you he's going to yeah. bite onto this section yeah. because... The language used is conditions and restrictions, and then he names requested not to travel or make public appearances. And then he goes on to say, and there are no, oh, here's where that kind of covers us. It says, there are no audience notes from my predecessor, Cardinal Giovanni Battista Ray, imposing on the retired archbishop the obligation to lead a quiet and private life with the weight normally reserved to canonical penalties. So what that's saying here is there was nothing signed on paper giving the canonical penalty of a private life of prayer and penance. But there were commands right. from Pope Benedict. They were known to Cardinal Ouellette, and Cardinal Ouellette orally gave these commands to Archbishop Vigano to be applied to McCarrick. Yeah. And we know that Ar Archbishop Sambi, the previous nuncio, got into a yelling, screaming match with Cardinal McCarrick on these restrictions that were laid upon McCarrick. Right. And for me, 
this is the most, I mean, we, this is the most important bit of news that's come out since Vigano issued his first testimony. You agree? Agreed strongly. So it's such that Cardinal Willette, all I'm saying, just to, to, to back up for a half a moment, all I'm saying is, yeah, I, I don't know what Willette's doing here, but he's a smart guy. He knows that this, that these, this paragraph and a half vindicates at least, you know, corroborates at least the bulk of Vigano's testimony or, or whatever, his, his 11 page letter. So why, why do it if you're attempting to rebuke Vigano? I, I don't understand the inclusion of that, that portion. The only thing I can think of is that Woulette is trying to say, hey, there was nothing written down canonical. So, you know, it's kind of gentlemen's agreements. Uh, maybe he's trying to state Francis didn't overturn anything because there was nothing canonically issued. It was all sort of done on a handshake. And so therefore, when Francis reversed it, Francis isn't breaking, he's not reversing a canonical um, act of Pope Benedict. He's just sort of unaware of the handshakes and, and the gentleman contract. And so Francis is innocent. Maybe that's what he's trying to insinuate. What do you think? Arguably, but but the the um, the hinge point of Vigano's testimony was never whether or not it was written or oral information information passage and instruction sharing from from Pope to Pope, you know, and and from uh, from from Pope Benedict to Pope Francis or from Pope to ambassador. The hinge point was always whether or not the transmission of the message uh, about the danger of uh, of Cardinal McCarrick had been effectuated, and and he's admitting that it has. You yeah. can't get around that. And yeah, he's I'm, saying it. Well, not, that's not stupid. So yeah, he's saying it's not only Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. It's also Archbishop Peter Pietro Sambi. It's also me, Vigano, right. and. As I put right. pointed out in my second testimony, it was you too, Willette. And now Willette says, yeah, it was me too. Right. 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 That's that like you I mean, you you did all the work that you cut the meat from the bone. That's yeah. that's the most important aspect of this. I, I don't know how to get around it. I don't know how to explain it rather. Yeah. And then and then um Willette says this. This is kind of Willette trying to get Pope Francis off the hook here. He says by the Supreme Pontiff are based on the information available to him at the time. And they are the object of prudential judgment, which is not infallible. So here we actually have Ouellette backing off of papalatry and saying, look, he's basically right. saying Francis made a mistake. He's saying Francis made this decision based on facts available at the moment. He used a prudential judgment. It wasn't infallible. Right. So he's giving right. some padding to Pope right. Francis in this section. Right. The kind of padding that, that you and I have been, that people, ironically, the, the defenders of the Pope want to uh, strip him of. It, it's, it's quite a, quite a right. strange, strange days are ours, right. you know. Wait, I, he does that in another line, too. I, I was looking for it as you were reading that. He, he, he's, he repeats that at least once where he's like, yeah, look, the Pope's, the Pope's not a perfect person or whatever we say in the popular culture. And um, he never gets to, and then most of the other, the other uh, content in his stern letter to Archbishop Vigano is sort of naked opining, you know, well, he'll say, he'll open all the other sentences. Like it strikes me that, or I don't believe that, or uh, I very much doubt that. That, that you would intend to do uh, thus and such. So there aren't, there aren't that many. Um, I think Christopher Altieri at uh, Catholic World Report was the one to say it's, it's basically a, a very underwhelming letter. There's not a lot of, of uh, pith here. Right? I, want to, I want to read another line here. Yeah. This is where Vigano actually does get a little bit aggressive, the most, he, the most aggressive he gets. And uh, he says, I think it's abhorrent. Willette. Willette. Sorry, did I say Vigano? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Willette, yeah. Willette to Vigano says, I think it is abhorrent, however, to you to use the clamorous sexual abuse scandal in the United States to, an, to inflict an unmerited and unheard of blow to the moral authority of your superior, the Supreme Pontiff. This is out of line, I think. He's, he's not doing something yeah. abhorrent, and he's not using a sex abuse scandal 
to inflict an unmerited and unheard of blow. And this is, their, this is the narrative coming out of Rome. Vigano is a disgruntled man. He never got the red hat. You know, he was demoted. Right. And so he's just this angry, bitter old priest. And so since he, you know, didn't get the red hat and he was, you know, disgraced by Pope Francis quietly, he's going to come out and, uh, and try to hurt Pope and Francis. And couple it, couple that with the line you read, you know, two minutes ago. They make no sense in, in conjunction with one another, right? With the, the admission, you know, Francis isn't a perfect uh, person. He's, he's, not, um, he's not infallible in, in the modes that he's cho- chosen to speak or act thus far. And, uh, and the admission that the transmission of the message had been effectuated, that doesn't jive with, what he's, with the accusation you just read. Right. I mean, yeah, because we'll let never says kind of goes back to it. The, the, the part that's not said here that Vigano says is he never says. And yeah, Francis rolled back what I told you, Vigano. No, he doesn't, he doesn't say that. But no. that's that's yeah. everywhere behind this letter. And, and that's the missing part that just screams out to us is, yeah, Pope Francis rolled back those restrictions. Maybe he won't call them sanctions, but he rolled back the restrictions and the entire Catholic Church globally is a little concerned about this. Pope Francis, will you speak to that? No. Right. So we have established, yeah, through Vigano and through, through Ouellette now, restrictions were placed on McCarrick. Francis sent him to China. Francis allowed him to have public appearances. Francis had him in Rome, staying at a seminary. Francis had him doing all kinds of stuff that were contrary to the restrictions. And we know Vigano right. and now Ouellette knew there were restrictions. So Francis lifted the restrictions. Right. Case closed. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the courtroom, one would look at this and, and uh, say corroboration. You have th- this is all I was saying 10 minutes back when I was like, is he is he attempting to help him? This is a, a Lionel Hutz job for Simpsons fans, you know, where he's he might not be trying to help uh, Archbishop Vigano, but but he is insofar as he just corroborated the the lamp in of the argument. Yep. Yep. It, it closes with a, it closes yeah. with I think the most offensive thing that Willett's written in this letter. He says, "Dear brother," so here we have some affection signs. "Dear brother, how much I wish that I could help you return to communion with Him, who is the visible guarantor of communion in the Catholic Church." This is, from a theological point of view, the most offensive because Cardinal Willett, as a cardinal, is saying, right. "I wish I could help you return to communion." with the Pope. He's saying you are not in communion with the Pope. You're in schism. How crazy is that? Right. Right. To, to be, you're not a schismatic for, so I guess you know, to take it back to, to Paul and Peter, Paul was a schismatic for, for, for rebuking Peter correctly. This, this removes, and, and ultimately this is the culmination of what we've seen with the spirit of Vatican II. This removes the consideration of correct doctrine versus heresy, you know, orthodoxy versus heterodoxy with a kind of uh, final authority from consideration altogether, right? It, it's just all that matters, if you're Catholic or not Catholic, based on how you countenance the Pope. Uh, yeah. It has nothing to do with truth or untruth, orthodoxy or heresy. This is what they've been playing at for 50 years. Right. And, at and least. now what's the highest is not faith and morals. The highest is preserving a perceived unity. Unity, yeah. Which I've done a lot then, of reading in the, in the semi-Aryan debate, and in the semi-Aryan debate in the 4th century, there was a lot of appeals to unity. Hey, why do you insist on using consubstantial, homoousios? Why, why do you insist right. on that word? It's dividing the church, Athanasius, we, we need to back away from that for the sake of the unity of the church. Well, right. Guess what? Four That's... out of five bishops, four out of five bishops, uh, uh, um, you know, Athanasius and, and St. Nicholas and, and you guys who are, who are hanging on to the, the original Trinity, teaching of the Trinity, four out of five bishops or so have, have gone with the Arians. Can't you guys just... Yeah. Join in this appeal for unity. Why yeah. are you dividers? Why are you dividing the church, right. you schismatics? And it, because it, truth matters. That's why. Yes. And it's not even that they were saying to them, homo is wrong. That 
that the son is consubstantial with the father is incorrect. They were saying, hey, we're not even right. saying that. Let's just back off the Nicene right. Creed because that's dividing the church. And they said, no, I'm going into exile. You know, that's right. that's nice guy Catholicism versus Nicene Catholicism. And I want more Nicene Catholicism when we have truth because the last time I checked, uh, the numbers and the stats in the Catholic Church are on the downhill. People aren't catechized. Right. People are, are falling away. So, um, Carnua lays it in again. He says, how could I answer your call except by saying, stop living clandestinely, repent of your rebelliousness, and come back to better feelings towards the Holy Father instead of fostering hostility against him. So he's making, he's saying, Can hey, I address that? Yeah, especially the clandestinely. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, what, what a, a Franciscan priest that I'm friends with uh, told me late last week is uh, it adds a, a great deal more contour to Vigano living in, in the shadows, um, as it were, at this point. Canonically, uh, I was told, I forgot to verify it, but canonically, um, if he is not served with process or a summons to return to the Pope, he cannot be, uh, there can be no interdict. He can't be excommunicated, not, not that he necessarily would, and he can't be taken out of the priestly uh, uh, capacity. So it's actually quite important, and has, there's quite a, a historical precedent for priests uh, or clerics that make rebukes of this sort to their authority, whether it's the pope or just um, you know, a, a higher up in the curia, to, to, stay, to stay hidden, because he has to be served with process. Uh, according to canonical dictum, so some someone can fact check that. So what? You, yeah, that's true. I, it makes I remember. A lot more sense I remember. True. They couldn't get Luther until they got him to show up at at a synod um, because he needed to be served, right? Um, and so Luther. That's right. I'm not using Luther as a good Wartburg. good example, yeah. but I'm just giving it. He went into <laughs> yeah. hiding, and yeah. he he grew out a beard, and he disguised himself. He had a, a different name. I can't remember the name exactly. I'll put a picture of Luther before and after on the screen so you can see it. It was it was. Carlos, I think he called himself Carlos Danger, right? <laughs> no, I don't that's think wrong. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, that's not right. It's getting deep. Um, that's it. But that's I, what it. do you think about that, yeah. Timothy? I mean, I kind of should Vigano hand himself over and be tried? Should he be in hiding? Absolutely not. You don't think he should hand Absolutely. himself over? He should. No. Uh, yeah. This this article I read to you uh, by by Christopher Altieri on Catholic World Report. A uh, fellow writer there, uh, you know, seemed seemed to be insinuating strongly that that he should. I I couldn't disagree more more okay. strongly because but he's sidestepping canon law. Is that you know, as a cleric, should he be doing that? Look, desperate times call for desperate measures, <laughs> okay. and he, he's not disobeying canon law. No, I mean I, this isn't this isn't cheap, a cheap kind of John Stuart Mill utilitarianism. He's sidestepping it. He's not disobeying it. Okay. Um, so he's what what a, would you say if Pope Francis state. said, uh, "I'm issuing a public summons to Carlo Maria Vigano to appear within 90 days at the uh, Apostolic Palace"? Do you think he would he should obey Still, it and come in? It's a tough question. Yeah, hey, he's a cleric. It is a tough question, but but it's interesting that Pope Francis hadn't said this. Yeah, he he takes a vow of of obedience, obviously, like all clerics do. And Catholic clerics do, and so that that would be a different matter. I'd have to uh, I'd have to noodle that one around. But this is important. I mean, what what this all begs is, is the proposition that this is important. What what Vigano did matters, and it it's of historical prominence. It, and it, so yeah, sometimes you have to thumb your nose at at uh, at, at tradition. I think it's interesting that Francis has not. Well, do you really want to say that, Timothy? Public... Do you want to thumb your nose at tradition? Like, I'm having a hard time on this element, right? It's kind of like, did Paul well, like, ca- did Paul rebuke Peter and then like run away and wait, or would Paul just keep going? I don't know. Like, it seems to me that Vigano should maybe show up in Rome and say, "Here I am. Try me. What have I done wrong?" It's. A- it seems to me to be an in issue of prudence. If, if the Pope you're answering to is Peter, who had already shown in good faith, you know, whatever it was, right. tradition states, over a decade before. 
Right. He, what we get from Galatians is Peter back down and says, hey, Paul, you're right. Yeah, just as yeah. he did at the Council of Jerusalem, right? Yeah. At the Council of Jerusalem, to which Paul was was pointing backwards and saying, we have to follow this. We agree right. this. Right. Peter had already shown good faith that he's willing to, even though Paul wasn't called a cardinal. We, we hadn't developed right. a cardinalate for another 900 yeah. years at least. Um, he was willing to consult his his brother bishops and to seek good counsel from them. And yeah. Paul was the smarty pants there. He's willing to delegate and to listen. And Pope Francis has shown plainly that not only is he not willing to, but he will flat out not even answer the yes. tradition of the dubia. Right. So it's an issue of prudence. It's not a right. simple reductive matter like, oh, come on, he's he hasn't been ordered out yet. But um, even if he were, I, I think it's an issue of prudence. <laughs> How could you answer otherwise if you think that what Archbishop Vigano has done is of historical importance? Right. I, my, I don't. I don't know how to just. say. My take on it is, if know. it's just canon, if he's only worried about canonical penalties, he should show up in Rome and mm -hmm. take it like a man. But if he's if he's worried about his life, that there's mafiosa types who would kill him and take him out or hurt him. If that's the case, then I think he has a right to protect his life and stay, like you said, in the shadows. But I don't know. I need to think about this more. It, it seems to me that in the church, even though if there's grave disagreement and there is the risk of canonical penalties, I think you have to face the music. I don't know. I need to think more about it. I agree. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. But it, it, it's not like you can direct those two, pull them apart and say, it, it, because no one really knows, aside from Monsignor Lanthiam, who, who passed it off as a joke, that there might be some, some danger to the lives of both himself and yeah. his former superior, Archbishop Vigano. Yeah, didn't he say, like, uh, if no you find really my body in... Speculation. Didn't, you, didn't he say, if you find my body in concrete, it wasn't a suicide? Yeah, no, if I'm wearing... If I'm wearing concrete shoes or if I'm cut up to pieces at like the bottom of the river, that, that wasn't me. Yeah, you know, it wasn't a suicide. Kind of a hilarious way of putting it. All right, we'll close here with the I, final. I don't know. I want to close here either. with the final paragraph by Cardinal Ouellette to Vigano. It says, Dear Vigano, in response to your unjust and unjustified attack, I can only conclude that the accusation is a political plot that lacks any real basis that could incriminate the Pope and that profoundly harms the communion of the church. May God allow a prompt reparation of this flagrant injustice so that Pope Francis can continue to be recognized for who he is, a true shepherd, a resolute, a, sorry, a resolute and compassionate father, a prophetic grace for the church and for the world. May the Holy Father carry on, full of confidence and joy, the missionary reform he has begun, comforted by the prayers of the people of God and renewed solidarity of the whole church together with Mary, Queen of the Rosary, Mark Cardinal Ouellette, Prefect of the Congregation for Bishops on the Feast of the Holy Rosary, October 7th, 2018. That's yesterday. So there it is. Any closing words on that, Timothy? Well, remember, the Feast of the Holy Rosary is the commemoration of the Battle Lepanto. of Ponto. Um, and remember... So I, I think this is funny because this letter was released. Was it actually released yesterday in in Rome? In uh, Rome, well, I think remember it was released ahead the of day us. before. Yeah, they're ahead of us. Yeah, they're ahead of us. So it was it was postdated to this important feast day, the Battle of Lepanto. I'm not sure if there's significance there. Everyone, you know, all of uh, Dr. Marshall's viewers, go Google the Battle of Lepanto. It's tremendously important yeah. in the history of the Church, in the history of the faith, and the history of the pontificate. Just as Archbishop Vigano had, had uh, post-dated his letter uh, to the Feast of St. Michael, even though he, he published it like two days, he leaked it two days earlier, but he wanted it dated with the epistolary date of um, the, the Feast of St. Michael. So, well, let's doing something similar, releasing well, the letter, we're actually aware writing and releasing it days before. Earlier in, the, earlier in the letter, I skipped this part, but Ouellette says to Vigano, how can you pray the Holy Rosary or pray to St. Michael the Archangel? So, Ooh, so oh, I, I, yeah, I forgot so about that. this is smart writing, so either it's just random yeah. or he's associating 
Vigano's testimony coming out on St. Michael, the Archangel's Feast Day, and then his coming out on the Rosary. So right. it's kind of interesting I, that that, I mean, I, this is a well-planned least. letter. This was not just Cardinal Ouellette at his desk late one night. This was a team effort. Many people right. vetted this, looked at it, and I'm pretty convinced that Pope Francis also got to read it before it goes out. That's an interesting note. I, I mean, at the very least, strange days are ours, and, and we can conclude by saying, I mean, it's sort of a, a position of desperation to say this is, this is all bad stuff, but the bad blood needs to come out, and maybe it is, but also at least it's interesting, you know, which isn't, it's, it's not much, but it's something we can cling to. They're good writers, you know, dating their letters in, with a lot of subscript, with a lot, a lot of winks and nods, mm-hmm. and um, there's a lot of text between the lines here. So if you haven't read it and you're sitting there listening yeah. to this podcast, go read it. And yeah, they're, they're, it. they're dating their letters on important dates that seem to enter into the very content of the argument. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, important stuff, and it's it's eight pages, seven eight pages, yeah. so it'll take you, you know, five minutes to read it. Worth it. So. As usual, right. we'll close off. Do not lose your faith on this. Remain Catholic. Remain firm, faith, hope, charity. Pray the Holy Rosary every single day. It was the rosary that brought the victory at Lepanto. And we need the rosary for Our Lady of Victory in our own times. Pray the prayer to St. Michael at the end of every Mass that you attend. Keep the faith. Don't get discouraged. Remember that our Lord Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. He's the King of the Church. Uh, ultimately, we are called to be faithful and to remain in a state of grace. That's the name of the game. So keep watching these videos. Thanks for watching. Please, please like and subscribe to this channel to get more videos as more news comes out on Pope Francis, Vigano, Ouellette, everybody. So Timothy, Timothy, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks again. I appreciate it.